Have you ever wondered why physical bookstores are still standing or how they've stood the test of time? This is a question that I thought of that was really sparked by an article that I came across in the New Yorker called Are Bookstores Just a Waste of Space? by Louis Menand. I hope I pronounced that name correctly, so apologies if I didn't. So this is a question that we're gonna be diving into about what has made bookstores and even libraries stand the test of time in such a growing digital age. So let's go ahead and get right into it. First, a little bit of history, because we need some context. Um, books have apparently been pretty hard to get a hold of for quite a long time, starting in the mid 19th century, when most books were actually sold by printers. In the early 20th century, again, very few places offered you know resources for customers to grab and buy books. However, some entrepreneurs did find a way to get books to them, one of those methods being book caravans to display books for sale. But the 20s is really kind of where it started to kick into gear. People could actually buy books by mail directly from publishers. They could subscribe to book clubs, and there is even a club known as the Literary Guild that still exists actually, and they in fact print their own editions, which they sell for well below the publisher's retail price. This is really cool, super interesting. Apparently it's still up and running. I haven't done research on it, but if you wanna learn more about it, please feel free. And around 1939, roughly 180 million books were produced, but only 2,800 stores actually sold them. So it was around this point that there started to be more of an inventory problem, that there were all these books that were being made, but not enough space to, to sell them or to display them. And of course, by the mid 1940s, around the World War II era, a lot of people were enrolling in college and of course needed textbooks. So this is where a pretty big boom in the publishing industry happened. And it was around this point that there was kind of starting to become a recurring problem, which was there was no way for people to just browse books because bookstores couldn't always carry the quantity of books that were available. One of those biggest reasons being because it's expensive to have a brick and mortar store. It's very, ex there's a lot of overhead and very low profit margins. Books had an increase in popularity. Booksellers could not always afford the rent for these large retail spaces. And just practically, a lot of books are heavy. You know, people, people can't always carry these books by themselves. So what was the solution to this problem? At this point, it was chain stores. In short, publishers needed more places for people to buy books. And this is where a couple really popular bookstore chains came to be around the 1960s. The first one being B. Dalton and a second one being Walden Books. I don't know if Walden Books sounds familiar to those of you who are maybe older than me who are watching this video, but they were a very, very popular chain housed in department stores and malls and stuff, which is something else that we're gonna be getting into in a second. But early on in its history with, with Walden Books, they were actually a textbook rental company. So that's kind of interesting. But these two Jane stores, uh, B. Dalton and Walden Books, they could carry a lot of titles and they were also embedded in malls and department stores because if you think about it, everything is kind of a one-stop shop at the mall, or at least at the time it was. It was a very, very popular option for people. So they would often sell, you know, discounted books through these, you know, malls and, and, and shopping centers. They were primarily based though in uh, very condensed neighborhoods or cities. So it still was a bit of an accessibility problem, but inventory wise, this was a pretty good solution for the time. And by the 1980s, as a result of these large chains in malls and, and shopping centers, this made up about 24% of all book sales in the US, which is definitely not a modest number. And a lot of other up and coming stores started to take notice of this. Two of the most popular probably being Barnes and Noble and Borders. And in the early seventies, a man called Leonard Riggio, apologies if I mispronounced his name, bought Barnes and Noble and adopted this crazy new innovative strategy of selling New York Times best-selling books at discounted prices, sometimes as much as 40%. This was a very, very popular strategy, so much so that people flocked to these locations, going out of their way to get their hands on these discounted popular titles. And by the late 70s, Barnes & Noble and Borders took note, capitalized on this, and were selling 43% of all books in the United States. And by this point, over 60,000 titles were being released every year. And by the late 90s, these chains, these up and coming chains like Borders, like Barnes & Noble took note of it, capitalized on it, and eventually, contributed to 43% of all book sales in the United States by 1997. This is crazy. And by this point, over 60,000 new titles were being released every year. 
So this tells me that there's always been a demand for books. Their books have always been a popular means of entertainment and of education. But because there was this rise in demand and in popularity for these chain bookstores, we had a new problem emerge, which was how are the independent bookstores going to survive? They cannot adopt the same strategies of marking down books by ridiculous prices in order to stay afloat and to stay competitive. Small bookstores had high overhead and low profit margins. The distribution problem for them had still not been solved small independent bookstore, a lot of books being published every year. It's like trying to fit a clown into one of those little tiny clown cars, you know, it just doesn't always happen. And as a result, from around 1998 or so to about 2020, so quite a large span of time, more than half of the independent bookstores in the US went out of business because they couldn't compete. How can you compete with all of these resources and all these markdowns that all these huge conglomerates can afford to do? It's just, you, you can't remain competitive like that. You have to rely on on your immediate community. And this is where something really, really interesting happened. In 1995, Amazon started their startup. I don't even know if that's the correct way of saying it, but Amazon began selling books through an online platform, right? They were selling books through the internet, which at the time was incredibly new. E-commerce was just starting to come around. It wasn't quite popular yet. The internet as a whole was still being introduced to society, this entirely new way of selling books, right? So let's go ahead and dive into that for a minute. Now, I watched a brief clip of a 1997 interview with a very young uh, Jeff Bezos, and the interviewer was asking him, why books? Like, why, why are we selling books on the internet? Like, of all the things to sell, why books? He said, there are more items items in the book category than there are items in any other category by far. So this was very, very strategic. As far as Amazon's inventory went at the time, they kept around a thousand books in a warehouse. Around 400,000 of their books were in just-in-time inventory. I didn't totally know what that was, but basically this is where Amazon would order books electronically from a network of wholesalers and distributors, and then it would be on the loading dock the next day. So just-in-time inventory. They had about 400,000 books in that category. Just over a million they got directly from 20,000 different publishers, probably at a discounted wholesaler rate or something like that. Took a couple weeks to get in. And for a fourth bucket, around 1 million in total books were actually out of print titles that continued to exist and they were able to carry some but maybe not necessarily all of those so there was no longer really a distribution or an inventory problem because they were acting sort of as the sun drawing their books from all these other wholesalers kind of around them and selling them through the internet they didn't have to worry about overhead they didn't have to worry about low profit margins like this was a pretty darn smart solution for the late 90s. It kind of blows my mind actually. Altogether, they had an inventory of about 2.5 million books. Absolutely wild. All housed under the same business that is Amazon. So this absolutely added a layer of competition when it came to book sales and just the book business in general, right? Jeff Bezos with Amazon had solved the distribution problem by just selling a bunch of books online. He adopted Barnes & Noble's discount strategy because, and this wasn't a problem because his venture capitalists or the people that helped to fund Amazon early on in its inception recognized that he was investing in a future of e-commerce that would pay it back tenfold, twentyfold, and obviously it, that's been proven correctly. And finally, he responded to a statistic, which was that web usage at the time was growing at 2,300% per year. This guy did his research. I'm not gonna lie, whether or not you like Amazon or Jeff Bezos, this guy was really, really smart about it. And now, zooming out even more, they constitute more than half of all book purchases in the United States. And this happened really, really quickly, if you think about it. They came about in the late 90s, 1995. Within about 25 years, they went from a startup and a little garage to just this huge, huge, I don't even know, conglomerate chain? I, I don't know, just this huge brand. It's everywhere. I mean, it's, it's so hard. To, it is hard to actively avoid Amazon nowadays. That growth is crazy. Now, if we're gonna talk about bookstores, we have to talk about libraries too. In my mind, the two of them kind of go hand in hand. So let's talk about how libraries fit into this. When I was doing my research, it actually seemed like libraries, and I wasn't really expecting this, but it makes sense. It seemed like libraries were actually a little more ahead of the curve than bookstores. And I'm gonna explain what I mean by that. In 1932, I was surprised to learn that this is when checkouts, like book checkouts went electric. 
For years, people had a two card system. That's like that little library card that you think of that's like hidden in the sleeve of like the inside cover of a book. Each book had a card where checkouts were noted. Borrowers had a personal list for their selections. And now we have embossed library cards where, you know, it's registered to our name and our address and everything is on it. And all you gotta do now is just scan it. It's crazy. And by the 1940s, this is where high-tech distribution came into play. And this is kind of where it gets really interesting too. People could find the exact books that they were wanting and have near immediate access to it by way of dumbwaiters and pneumatic tubes. These people were freaking smart. I don't even know. And in the 1970s, this is where computerized catalogs came in. Because if you think about it, like I've only seen pictures of it. I've never actually experienced it myself. But I, I think the way that it used to be was in these libraries, you'd have these big, huge, like, like, I don't even know, like wardrobe looking things that had like drawers in it that you'd have to pull out and find the call number of the book and stuff. Not a thing anymore. In the 1970s, it was all digitalized. Computerized catalogs, catalogs became the norm. Libraries, in fact, now had a computer system that they developed that allowed people to create and store records across all different types of libraries. And in the 1980s, about 10 years later, this is where they began dabbling in digitized content, which is what probably you and I are a lot more familiar with now. The Library of Congress began several pilot projects to digitize items from both its print and non-print collections. And in, and in the 2000s, you know, as this kind of started to catch on, this is where RFID technology came into. And if you're not really familiar with that, it's sort of like a little sticker. If you think like whenever you go shopping and you're looking at clothes or something, you know how there's that little security tag on it? That's kind of like what it is for books, except it's a little sticker with a chip inside. And you know, all you gotta do, like at my library, I just scan my book and it automatically populates like what the title of it is. It's, it's it's so cool. So in the 2000s, this is where that RFID technology started to become a little more normalized and digital newsstands were also introduced. So you wouldn't have physical newspapers as much anymore. You could just leverage the internet to get all the information that you need. And from about the 2010s until now, a lot of cool, innovative things have been happening. I mean, there's STEM that's now integrated in, in libraries, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. There's creator spaces, there's technology checkouts. I can literally go to my library and check out a telescope right now if I wanted to. There are digital literacy programs. There are computer classes that are being held. There are digital reading materials. Libraries are in fact a one-stop shop for the average Joe, for any kind of person, any time that they need, and there's no pressure to ever buy anything. I freaking love libraries, dude. So with all of this being said, the question still remains, why do bookstores and even libraries still exist? Based on all the information that's been discussed today, these are my thoughts. A physical bookstore place offers three benefits that e-commerce can't. The first one being tactile dimension. You can actually touch and interact with the product that you're wanting to buy. You can flip through it, you can smell it, you can like have a good time with it, take it out to coffee, have a date with it. There's just things that you can do physically that you can't do you know, through a virtual platform like Amazon, for example. There's also the element of customer service. When bookstores were introduced to these malls and shopping centers you know, or you know, department stores or whatever, that didn't necessarily mean that the person recommending that book to you had actually read the book that they were recommending to you. So salespeople tend to be book lovers and can recommend new and forgotten titles that aren't algorithmic. And I think that's probably one of the biggest differentiators is that it's human contact. It's one person telling another person, I like this book, I think you would too. And in my opinion, with my marketing brain, it is just really, really hard to break that word of mouth. And finally, they are experimental community building spaces where they welcome everyone. They host events. They have author appearances or, or, or guest speaker appearances. They have readings. They have book signings. Some even cater to specific demographics or even genres. I heard about a bookstore somewhere in the world. I want to say New York City because all the book buzz happens in New York City about a um, female black bookstore owner who only sold romance books. So it's really cool and targeted in that way too. And in fact, there was a quote that I'm going to pull from this article um, that I'm, you know, that this was all inspired by from uh, the New Yorker. And the author of that article says, I don't want 200,000 titles to choose from. I want the staff to have selected from the zillions that are out there the kinds of books that interest me, right? It's just human connection. It's human connection. And actually, after the pandemic, there has been a small but significant uptick in the number of independent bookstores. And I, I have done no research on this, but I would imagine a lot of that is due to the popularization of book talk. So I hope you found all of this really interesting. I tried to keep it relatively shorter. I just wanted to kind of explore this kind of topic. I think it's so interesting. Just 
what makes bookstores so special, how they've stood the test of time through recessions, through wars, through pandemic. Like it's generational. Everyone can have a shared experience when they go into a bookstore and especially when they go into a library. A grandparent, your parent and you probably all have very similar experiences when it comes to books. And sometimes it's just really hard to beat cracking open a new spine of a book with that new book smell. I don't even know. There's something that's just so wonderful about it. So I hope you got something out of this video. If you did, please consider liking and subscribing by doing that. You're letting other people know that you got something out of this and that it is worth sharing because you like the content in it. And with that all being said, I hope you have a great rest of your day and I'll catch you in the next video soon. Take care until then. Bye.